This is Late Republic Nonsense, this time with Saurav Omari. Hey, how are you? What's going on? I'm good, Dave. It's been too long since I've seen you in person. Good to good to see you digitally. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, you know, as, as, as you said on Twitter, um, it, it's, uh, it's been a long time since we were both in D.C., uh, in you know inside this inside the swamp and I feel like actually I mean it wasn't that long ago what is it you know five seven ten years it's not that much time and yet More everything has changed ago, actually and yet, yeah. right and yet with, everything with Morton's, in the, Morton's uh, smoke room upstairs right yeah. which I'm sure I'm sure there are folks that are there right, right now, now with, right, right now as as uh, you know as as we speak I felt like I needed to leave there for my health because there are only so many, uh, you know, fillets that I can eat at 10 p.m. and uh, and and kind of you know be functional with my you know with my fit, fitness goals at the same time. But uh, but look, I mean, I remember that time fondly, and uh, you know, and and, and, and and many discussions. And, I'm, I'm giving it a slight homage by yeah. having a, a little scotch. But exactly, exactly. Well, so, we- in the in the time that is that has transpired you've done a lot of things and you've come, you know, you've, you know, I guess you, in that time you converted to Catholicism. You've, uh, you, you were, you took a, 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 um, a, a job for a long time as the uh, opinion editor at the New York post. Um, you became a, let's say, uh, you know, you, you became a, a media star in regards to a, a, um, particular conservative philosophy that you and, and, and some other folks have been um, have been have been pushing have been have been offering as an as an anecdote as an alternative to what has been in let's say mainstream conservatism or or, or um, you know what I like to think of as um, as like mainstream post Cold War conservatism because that's when I think everything you know everything changed and got corrupted. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, so I just wanted to, to, you know, I just wanted to have you on to talk about it. Maybe, you know, if you could introduce the topic and, um, uh, you know, and, and, and talk about, well, I'll, I'll just let you introduce the topic. Go ahead. Sure. I mean, um, well, since you mentioned, you mentioned Morton's and, and, and Washington, you know, it's been a it's been an intellectual journey. I mean, at the time I was what 23, 24 years old, and my entree to the conservative movement was through the neoconservatives. Um, I'm Iranian of background, and um, you know, it was the neocons who were talking uh, about the human rights situation in Iran, about democracy in the Middle East, and those were things that I cared about a lot at the time. And then as I, as I evolved as a man, you know, I, I got married, I became a Roman Catholic. That's a long separate story. I become a father. Those concerns of the neoconservatives seemed more remote for me hmm. because what I was looking at was a kind of a, an America that was, and I, that I love an America that I have no other home. I'm an immigrant from Iran. There's no going back to Iran, as you know. Uh, for someone like me, and yet I I worry about it disintegrating from within, culturally decaying, materially decaying, not just even the cultural stuff, but even our infrastructure. Something's just gone wrong internally, such that a decade later, you know, to finish the story arc, you know, I just had a piece in the Washington Post saying, "Stay out of Ukraine." A lot of our you know conservative friends who are still considering themselves kind of freedom agenda new conservatives. Uh, recoiled at that and and they were like wow this really is your sort of transformations complete um now i think that from my point of view of my own intellectual autobiography it's more internally coherent than that it's kind of it's sure. thought through it's not just an abrupt set of changes um it's like thinking i love this country i want to preserve what's good about it and i don't think that the that the real threats although they are threats are external ones it's not ultimately right what Vladimir Putin says or does, you know, it should be taken seriously. It's not ultimately what even China does, although that definitely should be taken seriously. But like our weakness in the face of those forces has a kind of internal root. Um, And my goal is to try to address that more deeper root cause. 
Right. And, and, and look, I mean, it's not as if you were having this, um, you know, this, this change of perspective in a vacuum. Um, mm-hmm. It's together with a whole lot of people when, and, and, and that movement away from, you know, let, let's say the default position of neoconservatism for, for assuming that the threats are always and forever external. Um, mm-hmm. That comes at the same time as you've got increased insane polarization and you've Mm -hmm. got i mean the rhetoric coming from the rhetoric coming from the left is full stop eliminationist you know that that you know uh, that the neocons 20 years ago would have said look this is a problem that's happening this this is a pre-genocidal um you know type of rhetoric that's happening in in a faraway place and i think we've become accustomed to that Mm -hmm. and um and a lot of that i think has to do with you know, the end of the Cold War consensus together with technology. I mean, now it's very easy to segregate, you know, oneself into, into, uh, into, uh, you know, a, a, a silo, a silo, an intellectual bubble or whatever. And, and, and you have a steady stream of, um, you know, of, of affirming messages and thoughts and likes and retweets and things like that. So, I mean, and it, but that's not going to stop, you know? So, so, I understand your, you know, your, your, you know, movement here, your, your change is in the context of, I mean, I understand in the context of my own. I mean, I was in the same place. I absolutely would have supported, um, you know, tougher, uh, you know, a, a tough response to Russia. You know, I, I, I still had, I mean, part of this, you know, is, is that, uh, is that many of us still had a cold war mentality in regards to Russia. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, and we saw, we, you know, we, we did not update our firmware. And the other part of it is, I think, look, the, the Russiagate thing that happened for the course of like five years did more damage to the concept of expertise in American politics than like anything that anything that had ever happened, you know, prior. Um, if you were a Russia expert, you know, quote unquote, credentialed professional Russia expert, nine times out of 10, you were, you, you, you know, you bought wholesale so much bullshit Mm -hmm. that was just pumped out of the media. Why? Because you hate Putin and whatever Putin, and you hate Putin and you hate Trump and whatever they suggested to you that is, you know, remotely possible or even impossible that was bad. They did it. They were certain, you know, could they do it? Then they did it. Mm-hmm. And that's a tremendous analytical failure from, uh, you know, from the, you know, from the people that supposedly should have known better. Now we know based on who, who writes the checks for, uh, you know, for, for Russia expertise in, 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 inside the Beltway, either it's Paul Singer or it's, uh, you know, George Soros. Um, you know, now we know that we should have been more, uh, more circumspect the whole time. But um but yeah, I mean that's that's where, where we are, and and here we are on the precipice of something with with uh, with with Russia and Ukraine. I, I I don't think it's going to be a military thing, but uh, you know, but it very well might be. But certainly, we're dealing with the same people who were pushing absolute nonsense and lies, uh, you know, and not inconsequential ones, geopolitically significant lies, uh, you know, for for. For, for five years about, um, you know, about, about Russia and, and all this stuff. So like, it's not you that's, you know, it, it's not you that's, that's necessarily an apostate. I think half the country basically has apostatized from what once was, you know, the establishment uh, religion of post-Cold War uh, neoconservatism or, you know, repackaged as mainstream establishment republicanism. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned um, you mentioned the Russia Gate hoax. Um, that was one of the big uh, milestones for me. I think there were um, a few I want to go through mm-hmm. and see if may- maybe they resonate with you as well. Um, the first one where I I began to have big doubts, having been kind of taken up the um, kind of liberal consensus view, and when I say liberal, I don't just mean the left. And this is important to maybe get at the outset is that um, we really have to get over this tendency to call um, uh, uh, to pretend like there isn't a 
a right liberal tradition that much of what we talk about with 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 the American consensus are um, and is an opposition between the left and right sides of liberalism. They both emphasize um, individual autonomy as the highest good. They both emphasize open borders. Um, they both want a kind of primarily commercial civilization. And um, even if that comes at the costs of the goods of political family, the working class conditions of the working class, um, uh, borders and so forth, they have no patience for. And there is a right version of it, which is like the American Enterprise Institute. And there's a left version of it, which is, you know, the left, what we call the left. Um, and my first break, big break with that kind of liberal consensus was the Arab Spring. Again, mm -hmm. I viewed the Arab Spring through the lens of that liberal consensus. Ah, oh, young Democrats uh, coming out into the streets, Tunisia, Egypt. And then I immediately saw the outcome, um, which was that, you know, really nasty forces were destabilizing um, the vast swaths of the Middle East and North Africa, creating ungoverned spaces, creating failed states, civil wars. And I, I guess I was a little bit quicker than others to say, than others who were in the same boat of kind of liberal cheerleading to say, hey, hey no, this is pretty bad. Right. And their, their refusal to sort of shift as, as quickly as I did made me think I'm not quite with them. Um, the next one was the, the European migrant crisis. I was mm. working for the Wall Street Journal um, opinion pages at the time. I was based in London, um, so working on Wall Street Journal Europe. and. Our idea, my and our idea, was that we should be very receptive to this, right? It's like uh, aspirational immigrants coming over from the wars of the Middle East, and Europe can handle this. Yes, we should have more pressure to help them assimilate, but on the whole, it can be done. And then I hit the ground, and I went and I lived with uh, the migrants in, um, in the safe house in Istanbul, where the Afghan migrants were coming. And I speak Persian, so I, can, I, I passed myself off as an Afghan mm -hmm. and stayed with them for days. Um, I traveled with them through the kind of Greek Isles into the Balkans and walked up with them, different groups of them at, at, at each given point. And I noticed, contrary to the media narrative, they're all sort of 18 to 24 year old males. Um, a lot of them are just economic migrants, the vast majority of economic migrants. So, so yes, OK, things are miserable in the Middle East, but they're not legally refugees. And yet we're just letting them come and calling it a refugee crisis when in fact it was a migrant crisis. Um, I saw the brutality of that they conducted among themselves, how violent they could be with each other. And I thought, what are you talking about, Angela Merkel, that we can do this? We're Schaffendas, we can take a million. You know, you can't. You know, I'm again, I'm Iranian, I'm an immigrant. I speak their language, I'm sympathetic. But it was crazy to think that the, that the West could absorb the number. And yet that was the media consensus. I remember, I always talk about this anecdote that, um, you know, when you read The Guardian or you read The Wall Street Journal, they would say, um, you know, Ahmed, an in a Syrian engineering student. And I'd be like, OK. And then I hit the I hit the migrant sort of trail myself and I would talk to them and the guy would I would say, well, what did you do in Syria? And they, he would say, I was an engineering student. And every single one was an engineering student. And Syria had so many goddamn <laughs> engineering students. It would be Switzerland. It wouldn't be Syria. Um, so I quickly realized it was the first time a kind of media narrative shattered before my eyes with my yeah. reporting, right? Like right, I right. Someone, I wasn't like I was reading someone else and was convinced by it that it was I was reporting it. And what what I saw ran contrary to what sure. we were being told to believe. And then the last one was was uh, the one you mentioned, the the the, the Russia hoax, you know, yeah. and this tendency of elites where it's like, you know, you invited a million more than a million migrants. They destabilized uh, uh, countries up and down sort of central eastern europe um and into the into the western and northern europe um you have a highly financialized economy that leaves a lot of working class people behind uh, all sorts of other internal crises and so they vote for populist politicians whether it's in europe or the united states and you say oh it's because the kremlin rigged our right. yes. the kremlin facebook ads yeah. yes. that drove me crazy it's it's very anti-democratic sure you know, and and it was incredibly destructive, right? It's incredibly right. destructive what they did. Well, um, it's my it's my uh, it's my view that the Russia 
that the whole Russia narrative was not me- was not intended for Democratic voters. It became mm-hmm. one that was adopted by Democratic voters, but it was primarily aimed at, uh, at, at, at making sure Donald Trump had no support among neoconservatives. Oh, and, sure, yeah. And the mainstream right commentariat. And this was a huge shift. This was huge. They thought like, hey, if National Review is going to hate this guy and think he's a, 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 a foreign agent and the Weekly Standard and, you know, every place that is a an established, um, you know, uh, an established influence uh, node for the Republican Party is saying no, 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 Russia, mm-hmm. um, then, you know, then then uh, Trump will be dead in the water. And you know what? It worked brilliantly on all of those people. On almost not on those, not on voters, <laughs> but not on voters exactly, which pissed them off, and and it pissed off, it pissed off the, um, it pissed off the, uh, the 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 establishment commentariat more than anything, because suddenly they found out that nobody was listening to them, and that they were redundant because new voices were emerging, and um, you know, and and a lot of people, of course, a lot of people were were you know, furious at that. And I always think about, I always think about Ornette Coleman and free jazz and his arrival in 1959 in New York in the jazz scene. And he shows up and of course he is hated by all the people that had spent decades studying one particularly narrow, um, you know, aesthetic, um, uh, you know, component of jazz. All of a sudden it's shattered and they, they realize, hey, either my entire um, career and education and everything was wasted or, um, you know, let me, you know, kind of reorient myself. And a lot of people just, or, you know, or, or the, the other option is I don't even want to deal with it. Fuck these people, mm-hmm. which was what 90 percent of, of, uh, of, of the folks did. You know, they lashed out at the audience. You know, for for being um, insufficiently you know supportive, for not clapping loud enough uh, for them, and um, and that's something that I mean, you see them now at the dispatch, you see them at the um, at the uh, bulwark. the other one? The bulwark. The co- yeah, the right. The cockshed. Yeah, and, I was um, say that the, the, you have a good name for it. I don't know if yeah, you coined it or who did. But. Yeah, I I did not I did not coin it, but whoever coined it was a genius um, because it was great. And and you know, I know your 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 um, I don't know if you want to discuss your your high profile tangles with uh, with David French, but um, I know why you picked David French because he is like, you know, I mean, he is he's just perfectly the perfect distilled uh, essence of this essence of the knee of, you know, uh, in, of, um, of right liberalism. I mean, perfect value free everything. You know, there is no better uh, phrase. You, you know, no more paradigmatic phrase than, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the blessings of liberty mm-hmm. for, um, you know, for like, uh, what is it, um, uh, cross-dressers in school or something, right. you know. Right. Doing, drag queen doing, doing, story drag, hour. Drag queen story hour, yes, yes, ex- yeah. exactly. You know, yeah. so, um, so you went at French for that, you know, for the value neutrality, which is like, which is the thing that, which is like, let's say, saying the value neutrality as the highest good, as opposed to, um, you know, as, as opposed to, to other goods, like, like the common good. How, how would you define the common good? So the common good of a community is, is, is the flourishing of, of all its members. And common goods are goods that only the community can secure and that aren't diminished the more they're shared. So they're not private. Private goods are competitive. You know, if I have X, X, Y, Z, it could come at your expense. Mm -hmm. But things like justice, peace, um, good order, um, uh, um, you know, or or something, you know, the environment, you know, um, these are goods that aren't if you preserve them or you secure them, they're not diminished by being shared. And I individually can't do it. You individually can't do it. The whole political community has to do it. And there is a there is a kind of American analog to it. I mean, the uh, the the Constitution's preamble says that this this document has been 
is being enacted in order to secure the general welfare. Um, and uh, uh, but the common good kind of assumes that there is that there is a legible account of what makes people flourish, that that happiness is not subjective, but that there are there is an objectively correct account of what a happy human being is. He's a he is a rational animal. He 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 seeks the ultimate causes of things, and he can he can dialogue as you and I are now. He is a religious animal. That is he. No matter what, he will worship something, um, and and uh, he will seek to enshrine um, his faith in the public square, one way or another. He's a political animal, um, and um, he and 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 he uh, he's social. Therefore, he thrives in political community, and in um, in family as well, that is very core to him, to his development. So there is like this kind of uh, objective account of what a happy person is, and this was uh, very much emphasized in the classical tradition, the Greco-Roman tradition, and then the um, Christian tradition incorporated that, and that is the kind of Western tradition when it comes to the the, the pre-modern Western tradition. Right, and but there's been there's been a reluctance to admit that for right. you know i mean right, right. But, for, well, what's, for, what's, yeah. what's notable about french and neutrality this is what we have to say is that the right liberals and a french is someone who is is you know paradigmatically as you said a right liberal right he he <clears throat> wants to maximize individual autonomy and thinks that um you know freedom ultimately doesn't have a, an objective end it's a, it's a good in itself in every case um, and the goal of government is just to secure everyone their kind of maximal freedom, short of harming someone else. Um, um, but they kind of retcon this account back onto the American founding, back onto even to the pre-colonial era. And that's simply not true. What I described as the more kind of common good um, oriented account of, of what makes a political community worthwhile and what makes for human flourishing is the one that prevailed in in colonial america and at the founding and there are so numerous examples of this i mean obviously i the one i focused on is is our sabbatarian tradition the idea that you know one day a week should be set aside for for rest and worship that's not just in puritan new england that existed in in, in New Amsterdam or what became New York, it existed in Virginia, which was supposedly the kind of more quote unquote secular colony. And then it was at the founding certainly. And this tradition persisted for many, many years through the 19th century and for much of the 20th century or obscenity laws. We've had obscenity laws, again, common law obscenity laws going back to the colonial era, federal obscenity laws going back to the founding. Um, it's this, this, um, this version of America in which we should just have freedom of action for every worldview. There's no, there's no distinguishing between the man who puts on a dress and, you know, uh, latex boots and twerks in front of kids. There's no difference between that and, you know, I don't know, teaching kids, math good stuff whatever yeah. that might be right. that's not twerking the idea that there's no moral distinction that the law can't make any moral distinction with that is a, is a post-war thing mm -hmm. it's it's a relatively recent invention it it doesn't it's it's an invented tradition it has no roots in the american tradition and so a lot of these kind of french type figures um rely on a, on a, on a kind of a fake account of what america was and is still Right. Um, and that's been my project recently is to kind of rediscover America's because a lot of common good traditions, you know, it, it goes back to Aristotle. It goes back mm -hmm. to St. Thomas Aquinas. It can seem foreign. Yes. But but it's very useful to remember that this was also the frame for the founders, many of whom were Christian believers and were steeped in this classical tradition and um, and, and and were not nearly as libertarian as libertarians today pretend. Right. And, and that's true. I mean, I don't think you, um, I don't know, so someone said that you have to go back, you know, no more than three generations for basically anyone in America to find a very religious person. Right. 
Yep. And that is, um, you know, and I think that's true. Like, I mean, if you, if you want to say the fourth, then, then, you know, third, fourth, what does it matter? The point is, is that we have a, um, you know, we, we've kind of run out of the value fat, so to speak, mm -hmm. that used to be called common sense, mm -hmm. that used to keep these, these, these things in check. And, and I know that there's a debate on the right too, with, within, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, within folks on the right that say liberalism was always corrupt because it would always necessarily lend itself to this type of decline. And um, I'm not sure if I buy it. I think it's I think it's too too uh, you know it, it's it's too fatalistic and and gives you it gives you very few solutions other than a you know other than um, you know. I, you know what? To tell you the truth, I'm not even sure what the what, what the, the other the other option is. You know, um, but maybe some kind of you know weird authoritarianism that that or or uh, or, or you know religious fanaticism that uh, that you know bucks no deviation. But I think everything deviates. Every you know it's the nature of things. Um, you know to trend towards uh, towards entropy. Well, no, I would I would pause that and say yeah. it, it, that liberalism itself in becoming fully itself has revealed itself to be highly authoritarian, right? Sure. In other words, uh, liberalism says, I just want to liberate the individual to define truth for himself and not have these authoritative institutions like the church or like the, like the family um, determining the good of a person, right? So even things like circumcision and baptism are somehow oppressive, right? Because they're not, the person right. is not getting to choose for themselves. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting as that process has gone on. Um, in fact, we live in a, in a highly regulated society, right? We, it, in fact, um, it, right. it's someone's going to do the regulating. Enough, it has not enough right. for me to be able to define myself, myself sexually um, and just get rid of all the laws that restrain me sexually. You, Dave, have to recognize that I was always Sabrina. There was right. no Sorab. I have right. I have to affirm it, and and from this from affirmation, the next step is I I need to celebrate it. You I celebrate need to say it, and, and I need and to say it's the most wonderful thing. Right. Every kind of institution, corporate, academic, you name it, has to um, define. It has to define this. Has to, has to enshrine my loony truth. My lunatic yes. truth has to be. So what that tells you, it's it's inevitable that some orthodoxy or other will will reign in our in our public square. Um, and the other factor about, about, about liberalism, and this is what my friend Patrick Deneen emphasizes very well, is that it's not the case that individualism and statism are these opposing forces. Individualism and statism are, in fact, um, complementary they grow in tandem together liberalism yes. the original kind of 19th century liberalism kind of constantly severs the individual he feels dislocated he used to work on a farm there were kind of uh, the employer had to take care of him had had charge for him suddenly kind of industrial revolution comes around he's thrown into a city stranger a victim to kind of these uh, uh anonymous economic forces that can batter him this way and that and so what does he do? He goes to the state for protection. And the more people become individualized, severed from family, from community, from tradition, <clears throat> the more in order to protect themselves, they will turn right. to... Because there's no higher authority. There's, there's no, no higher authority. authority. Right. Right. They're the state. And so these two forces kind of constantly grow in tandem together. So mm. I am prepared to say that there's something, some kernel in liberalism itself that... Um, worked while still those kind of other pre-liberal institutions still had some meat to them, but that liberalism by nature kind of uses that kind of moral capital of these institutions, swallows them, chooses that so that, and then, but when you get to the end point, there is nothing left. And, and you especially see it in the way the COVID regime has been received yes. by, by lots of people. Yes. Um, so I, I agree yeah. with you completely on that point. Um, and, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's funny how, you know, sorry to cut you off about the, but the COVID, no, no. but, but, but uh, before that, I think the folks who are coming to this conclusion, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. are coming to it I, predominantly from a tactical political point of view. They realize that using the tools of right liberalism, mm -hmm. they are completely and utterly disarmed. They are totally disarmed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, there's, it worked for a while. It worked until the left was, was relatively at bay. But at this point, it's just, it's just completely crazy. And, and I think every day, and this is, this is um, what I say, you know, you know, do you know what time it is? The folks who know what time it is understand that you are absolutely defenseless with right liberalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, the right liberalism in many ways uh, empowers the mm -hmm. tyranny of the of the right. woke left, right? Because, for example, um, it is so emphasizes this kind of concept of private economic rights over above all other goods. Again, common goods about, for example, the good of workers, the good of um, the stability of a community and so forth. No, 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 absolute kind of private market rights. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you know, these right liberal institutions, I mean, that, I don't mean that just theoretically, they mm -hmm. kind of defend um, the tyranny of woke capital. They no, they literally do. Very material way. They are funded by Google. They are funded by Facebook to, and they do donor service. They do what they're asked to do to create these ideologies to legitimate, um, for example, a public square in which a sitting president of the United States can be banned by a private company. Or in my case, you know, I, you mentioned I work for the New York Post. Obviously, the most sure. kind of interesting but also traumatic experience of the New York Post in recent times has been um, having our Hunter Biden reporting be um, censored by by Twitter and Facebook. And you have, you know, a you're supposed to have a democratic public square in which this ancient institution, relatively ancient institution, founded by Alexander Hamilton, oldest continuously published daily newspaper in the United States, the New York Post, get censored at the whim of like five Silicon Valley dweebs. And they get to they set your private, you know, the terms of your debate and your, your public square. And you can't object to it because the right liberals say, well, it's a private company. Sure. Blah, 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 all the kind of old talking points. But, you know, what you so want to say to them is, if we have a public square, it's what happens on these platforms. It's what happens on Facebook. It's what happens on Twitter. If I go out there in the middle of a street and hold up a sign saying Hunter Biden is corrupt, people think I'm a nutter. And I won't right. get, it's on these platforms where it matters and they happen to be um, privately owned. Therefore, they're completely sort of at the mercy of a few oligarchs. Um, and so right liberalism of, you know, AI, National yeah. Review, Heritage, they are working to empower the economic structures yes. that the progressive left uses to silence conservatism in the united states silence its voice right as and, i say as i say all the time you know the uh, the the esta establishment conservatism taught that the that captains of industry are the greatest americans you know for the last 50 years and you know it was very convenient because it was captains of industry funding these institutions in order to, to teach that, you know, to teach that as the highest value. So like, you know, a lot of them, I mean, can we blame them for being so stupid that they look at Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, the, the head of Apple and, 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 uh, and, uh, you know, the, these, these, these massive tech monopolies, because really that's what they are mm -hmm. as, um, you know, world striding, you know, wonderful geniuses who, who, who must be defended at all costs. I mean, you know, as you say, there's a bit of corruption in there, of course, um, funding some of these, uh, funding some of these outlets that, you know, frankly have, have lost a great deal of, uh, of, of influence and readership. I mean, many people have can't just can't outright cancel the subscription. So they subsist on large donations from, you know, from, from, uh, from outfits like this that depend on them to, you know, to, to keep the status quo. And, um, you know, I know, we, you know, on Twitter and in articles and, and, you know, pieces, I mean, we're out there in what is the public square railing against these guys. 
Um, but um, I'm not sure if it's having, I'm not sure if it's having an effect because at the end of the day, as I said, these guys don't depend on eyeballs or clicks. It's true. And it isn't. Okay. They still, I mean, this, this was a lesson of, a, of, a, uh, this is the lesson of my time since the David French is a essay, mm-hmm. right? When, when I wrote the David French is a essay, and then before that I helped organize this, um, kind of manifesto called against the dead consensus which is fantastic yeah. we want a conservatism that is robust that de- that that defends wor- the working class that defends the family and um and i remember there was a kind of optimism in that period of, of all the signatories where we because trump had won and um you know it felt like these institutions could just be easily overcome and i think the lesson of the past three years is yes. wow they're deeply deeply entrenched and the, the little minions that they train you know uh <laughs> like just i don't know how they find them they grow them in a lab but suddenly this kid will show up and he'll he'll write an article you know the conservative case for transgender yes, blah, blah, yes. Blah, or the conservative case for why or they send him out to attack us Right, right, right. Like that's so really, his, you know, that's the, you know, the, there's a kid at National Review. That's his gig. He does yes. nothing but attack the right. You know, occasionally, yes. you know, they'll they'll put him on something else, but that is his that is his it's gig. His, that's his portfolio. Beat. Right. Yeah. And so yes, I mean, they have they have because they're increasingly donor led, and and they, they, they the, the paychecks will come, so they become a little bit unresponsive. And I think they become they've a lot of them take this pride in the sense that. Oh, I don't have to listen to you, rubes. In a way, yes. Um, one way or another, I get my paycheck, and we are the adults are talking. Shh, you know. Right. That said, um, I do think those weird kids, those like lab-grown kids we mentioned, aside, they are they're for the most part losing a lot of young people. I mean, I, t- I t- so many young people reach out to me who say, "I get it." I'm embedded in these institutions right now because I'm a conservative and that's where the jobs are, mm-hmm. but I hate it. I think that, you know, you guys, the, whatever you want to call us, the new rights, the post liberals, sure. the populists, that you guys are correct. And, and, um, and so there's this ferment of young people, mainly Catholics, but not exclusively Catholics who are um, very committed to, to changing the direction of the right in this country. There are new candidates that are, I think, um, um, right. making a mark. Uh, J.D. Vance, Blake Masters. In some ways, I would say, I mean, certainly Senator Hawley. Um, is, I would say Senator Rubio, Cotton, in, in various ways, are shifting against the kind of economic consensus. Um, so there, there's movement. And, I, I, you know, I think at some point, you know, you can have an institution that is flush with cash, but it, you, what you say just rings hollow. It doesn't, sure. it doesn't meet the realities of what sure. people are facing in the country, the, whether it's the censorship, the critical race theory, yes. the gender madness, the, the, the fentanyl deaths and the deaths of despair. What you're selling, this kind of idealistic vision, is just not it, – it, it, it doesn't reflect reality. And I think at some point it will lose influence. But it's a long battle, and it means people like you and me have to build institutions. Yes. We can't just like – you know, it, all the stuff we do is great. I mean, you know, podcasts and blogs and books and 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 op eds and so forth. That we do, we're, we're good at that. And in given our relative, like, um, the imbalance in in and how much money we have compared to these institutions. Sure, we're doing pretty okay, okay considering. Yeah. yeah, we were like punching far above our pay, but we have to build our own institutions so that those young people who want to work in Washington or want to work in state capitals and are conservatives, but they don't like the, the establishment, um, can find jobs, can find influence, can find a yes. path to, to growth. So you're one of, the, one, of, one of the few people who really understand that, you know, as someone who went through the journal, as someone who, who has been inside these, these institutions and, and understands them. I mean, look, I think a lot of uh, institutions are great if they're no more than a way station job opportunity mm-hmm. for a lot of kids getting a start in politics. Because right now it's not, I mean, we, we can't expect people, you know, we can't expect only the, um, 
you know, all, only the, the the children of the very wealthy to be able to take internships in D.C. or to, uh, you know, or to sort of participate in this way. Um, there, there are people who are, who are really good, who just need a gig. And it's amazing how the left understands so well. I mean, I remember, you know, yeah, a decade ago, I first looked at the Open Society micro grants and they're all online. You can, you can go and it's like 10,000 here, 10,000 here, 20,000 here, 30,000 here, blah, blah, blah. They're giving out tens of millions of dollars in tiny increments. Why? Because it's like, hey, you're tweeting. It's great. Keep going. You're writing, uh, um, you know, investigative pieces. You've got a blog. You, you you do, you know, something. You work in a, in community activism somewhere in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Take some money. We're going to pay for it. Not only that, they also provide free legal services mm-hmm. for left wing activists. Mm-hmm. How hard is it to find? You know, how hard is it to find that people? On the right, we have we have no such thing, and these are the things that that we need to build because, at the end of the day, they realize that um, you know you got to feed an army. The and, one guy uh, who did it on the yeah. right very effectively, um, you don't have to agree with, and I, I certainly have parted ways with him, but Bill Crystal was very good. Yes, at constantly creating like these kind of overlapping institutions. If someone took a risk and took a hit, there would be another job waiting for them at the whatever emergency committee for this and that, you know, the, right. the kind of letterhead organizations. Now we have to update that for the digital age. He was a man of the, like the late nineties and, and sure. early two thousands. No, but, but look, ad, very, look, very admirable. I'll much to learn from him. Tactically. Much to learn from these guys, because at the end of the day, um, they did not leave a soldier on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. And I, and I think doing so is the gravest, most horrible sin. Um, and, uh, because, you know, Hey, we'll create something new. We'll always give you something. The left, the left does this all the time. You know, um, what was the name of that? Um, the, uh, the, the, the attorney who, um, I mean, maybe he, he got disbarred, you know, part of Russia gate, whatever he was, he lied in the, in, in, uh, you know, in, in some capacity manufacturing evidence or what, what have you, he was gone for a minute, but like that guy will be at a white shoe law firm doing nothing for the rest of his life if that's what he wanted to, because he's one of their soldiers. For sure, yeah. yeah. You know, and 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 I've seen, I've been in this business a long time, and I've seen way too many horrible examples of people who are, who get in trouble for doing the right thing and they're shunned because mm-hmm. they may be too hot or whatever. Um, I, you know, off the top of my head, I can think of five without. You know, without really, without really thinking, and 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 at the end of the day, that's a tremendous, that should be a tremendous source of embarrassment, you know, to us, and but mostly to to our donors and the people who organize these things, because we need to protect our people, and any movement that doesn't protect its people um, is 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 worthless, and and I mean that's why I try to do my share of this as you know to, to the best of my ability when someone I who I know gets unfairly attacked yeah and this happens a lot you know the, the part of part of why the establishment right is corrupt and useless and um and worse is that you know the the right liberals just uh just um just take the method of attack that the left has been perfecting over the years and they just use it against their enemies and and you know usually using the same rhetoric um, in, in fact, and it's a terribly damaging thing. It's 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 um, it's awful. And, um, you know, we, I don't want to see any more people on the right canceled by other folks on the right. One of the darkest sort of most um, grim realizations that I came to my kind of black pill moments mm-hmm. was a few years ago, realizing that National Review mainly exists to poli- police the right, to discipline the right. Right. And always has. Yes. And always has. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I, I would say that their their capacity to do so is diminished, right? Their capacity sure. is radically diminished. You, I, yeah. I don't think they can Bozell people, as it were, right? Yeah. Like Bozell was um, Buckley's brother in law, who maybe in a kind of pioneering way saw liberalism headed in in a uh, in a in this. Um, very destructive direction early on and for breaking with the kind of liberal democratic consensus he was 
it's almost like a b verb, you know, like he was borked, he was bozelled, he was he was Marshall. butchered. Yep, and yeah. and 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 it it it's harder to pull off. Uh, I would say there is yes, there is just too many of us kind of uh, new right types with with some entree to the mainstream um, uh, in surprising ways that it's it's a little harder. It's a little harder. right. Yeah, I mean, I remember you know I went and I t I took a look at the founding, you know, the, let's say the founding blog post as it were. Of National Review back in in um, in the early fifties, and man, he spent more time policing the irresponsible right than touching the left. Mm -hmm. So I, you can see that really today in in the in the sense that National Review writers and you know by no means all of them, but but many of them, I don't say most of them, position themselves leftward, meaning their worthiest interlocutors are on the left. They deal with them, but. Anyone to the right, you know, there be demons in the old, um, you know, in, in, in the old, uh, you know, map making uh, terminology. Anyone, um, anyone to the right must be policed uh, for, you know, for, for one reason or another. And you, I mean, you can, there's so many examples of this um, that they're very, um, you know, they're, they're very happy to deal with folks on the left. They're very happy to deal with folks on the left. But um but our criticisms are illegitimate and the only time they deal with us is not really in a collegial way as much mm -hmm. as like hey let's sick the kid on them. um right you know, and, and 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 try to uh and and, and, tr and try to attack us um i think we would benefit from having the conversation about value neutrality um you know i know that they're all value neutral guys um, mm -hmm. Or that, or that they that they support that, you know. Um, but the more the more we talk about it, the more I think people, as I said before, they're coming to it from a pragmatic place. They're realizing that right liberalism has nothing to offer in terms of, um, you know, in, in in terms of of, of you know, uh, stopping the onslaught. You know, let's say protecting them and their families because that's where we are now. Um, you know, that's, that, that's, uh, that's where they are now, you know, either from state predation or from, um, or from, uh, you know, from, from lunatics on the left. And, and I think about how I know, you know, Bill Maher and Barry Weiss were in the news as folks who are, let's say liberals. Um, I'll even be generous and call them classical liberals. Mm -hmm which at the end of the day, again, are useless in this fight. And it took me a long time to realize that because for, you know, for, for several years, the only thing you heard out there is, oh, well, no, 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 I'm not a conservative, I'm a classical liberal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as if this was a, a mark of sophistication and, um, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and kind of, you know, moral health. You know, I'm definitely not one of those right wingers. I'm a, I'm a classical liberal. And, and I think the most, my most adamant classical, you know, self-defined classical liberal friends now are calling themselves conservative or something, but they have walked away from that label because I think they realize, yeah, it's empty. It's an empty, it's, it's great if everyone agrees on the fundamental premises of, you know, of, of, of your society. Everyone has an idea that's pretty much the same about what that common good is. Hey, classical liberalism, it's fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we're no longer in that world. And I think we'll never be in that world again. Well, one problem with, with classical liberalism is um, that um, they every classical liberal wants to turn the clock back to some earlier age of liberalism right. where things were okay. So a lot of like someone like, you know, Andrew Sullivan led the gay marriage battle and and won. But now the sort of newer stage of liberalism with trans stuff, he finds disturbing. But the problem is that that that, that project of liberation already contained within it all the yes. seeds and conditions that would bring us here. So if you turn the clock back, even if you could, which I don't think it's possible, it would we would eventually end up in the in the same place and so this is one of their one of their big issues the other one is um you know 
again, there's this sort of emptiness at the heart of the project of what do you, what do you substantively stand for? What is, what is a good society for, for Barry, whom I, you know, I used to sit next to in, in the Wall Street sure. Journal. I'm, I'm, right, I'm right. fond of him in, in many ways, but like, um, at least I would say this is going to sound crazy, but the woke in their own twisted way have a substantive account of society, of what society should right. look like. Yep. You know, it's a twisted account. You and I may not like it. You and I <laughs> may not. Say what you will, at least it's an ethos. But exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right. Big, but it is. It's a creed, actually. Yeah. And you, you, I, I think what the last few years, but especially the last two years, have shown us is that you have to meet a creed with a creed. You cannot say you cannot go to uh, a a a force like wokeism and say and 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 just say hey, can't can't we buy can't we just be civil because they literally smash you in the mouth, right? And doesn't mean we have to smash them back in the mouth. But if you if you are looking at society and you want to contain this woke force, um, you have to offer a substantive alternative. This is the good society. This is the truth, right? It's not that, well, let kids learn whatever they might learn in history class and without, no, we have to stand for the truth. Let kids learn whatever they want about sexuality. And if they want to cut their you know, <laughs> genitalia off at age 12, let them just don't force it on them. No, right. you have to say here, this is the reality about man and woman. It is the reality about man and woman is woven into the fabric of our DNA, right? And and it and is immutable. You can't you can't alter your sex. And so this is what what classical liberals aren't willing to do. And they get they get dominated. They have individual like little platforms and they often speak a kind of common sense to people who are like, well, the wokes are crazy. I'm with with Barry or right. I'm with Bill Maher. But in terms of a social solution to wokeism, it won't come there because it lacks a kind of substantive core. It, 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 uh, it, 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 it's it's not a it's not a creed. It's not a vision. It's a way for resolve. It's, it's sold as a way for resolving conflict, uh, deep conflicts in society. That's that was liberalism's premise, but obviously it's failed because we here we are. Right. Well, it was it was it was uh, it was created as a way to solve um, deeply held, uh, you know, deeply held, you know, religious convictions and things like that, and f figuring out how can we live in one society, how can we, you know. Um, Negotiate. How, how can we ne negotiate this between, you know, uh, not between people who, you know, who were furries and, you know, and thought that they were, uh, you know, uh, dragon kin or, 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 or whatever, but between, you know, deeply held, pe deeply held, very convicted religious people. Um, right. You but know, if you, if you say yeah. that society is entirely neutral. You know, you will have yeah, to honor to the it. Satanists. You will have yeah. to honor the people who want to who want to enshrine their furry statutes at the state capitol and say, "Hey, this is this is my truth." What are you, right, what are you and you have right, and you have no defense against it, right? Nope. And and I think more and more people are realizing that um, that you know, as you said, you can't defeat something with nothing, and um, you know, and and that uh, that that this is coming back. Um, but I want to, well, while I have you, I want to talk about the, the other week you, or even a couple days ago, you, you were tweeting about David Lynch and it was his birthday recently. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's a director who, who, who I love and whose, whose films have been, uh, have been very important to me. And you were talking about Mulholland Drive being the great film of the, um, I guess the great film so far of the century. Did I That's get that right. right? I stand by it. Okay. Um, so tell me why. I mean. I I don't know any other filmmaker who engages with with the dream world as as magnificently as David Lynch. I mean, first of all, I love this the just the mood that Mulholland Drive can put you in. I've seen it so many times. Mm -hmm. All the little hints, and there's a sort of universe of Mulholland Drive nerds who will like. They're great. Like, Those videos are great. Seventeen different yeah, yeah, yeah. interpretations, and each one will have a case of what the what the red toilet right. means, what the what the blue key means, whatever. 
I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not an obsessive like that. I've seen it so many, many times, but I don't I don't get into what it's just that mood, that sense of what a dream is like, what a nightmare is like. And to watch this movie is to experience a dream world while you're actually awake. So I love that. Um and I do think this is the one weird view that I that I've retained from my much younger days that I think there is something to the Freudian account of what dreams are, that they somehow yeah. express desires that you don't dare give um, expression to in, in your kind of orderly awake life. Right. And, you know, that's that's what Mulholland Drive is like. It's it, it it's how this woman, Diane, would reconstruct her life if things were, went the way she wanted to, as opposed to went the way they, they in fact did. So it's a. It's weirdly very kind of Freudian. Right. Um, no, 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 look, look, I, 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 I agree with that. I agree with that position too. Um, did you see, uh, I mean, I'm sure you saw the, 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 the Twin Peaks, the, the recent Twin Peaks. I have not seen the, 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 the Showtime one. I got to watch it. Okay. I mean, I've seen the old one, including the, the weird prelude movie, um, uh, Fire Walk. Fire Walk with me, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I tuned out TV for like four years. Right. I got I to gotta get back. So, so, so this was an event, and, and in kind of, um, I guess, proper Lynchian fashion, every episode was a letdown. Mm. But taken together, it create. you know, I, I, I think um, I think you'll be – You'll be very happy when you see it because of the, I mean, it is in fact the dream. And right. I think it's the most dreamlike of, um, you know, of, of, let's say the most dreamlike and abstract of, of, uh, of any of his films. I, I did not see um, uh, Inland Empire. Mm. Did you see that one? No, no, I have not seen it. I, I have okay. a particular yeah, yeah. obsession with Mulholland, I have to say. Okay. I got to yeah. see Inland. I've seen, um, what's the one you were promoting on Twitter? Lost Highway. Lost Highway is great too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very I mean, disturbing. It's so disturbing. I saw that, I, I saw that on a first date in Budapest yeah. where I was I was there in college. And, you know, we went to this movie, like, guys, ah, you know, David Lynch movie, whatever, let's go see it. And and what we saw or what I saw, just I, I was not prepared for you know i was not prepared for that but i was utterly engrossed the 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 film was just so beautiful like poetically beautiful and mm -hmm. and also dark and scary mm -hmm. as hell mm -hmm. um and um have you seen blue velvet of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. which yeah. which is another which is you know another another kind of crazy one and and we go back and we think of the time I'm I'm forgetting what else was was playing at the time that Blue Velvet came out, you know, and and it's just his his films are of no time, mm -hmm. you know. You can't you you can sort of see, um, you know, you can sort of see production clues. I think of it almost like Tom Waits' music mm -hmm. from the you know from the 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 eighties, which is like you know, or the eighties and nineties. Like it could have been made in the eighteen eighties. Or the 1970s, or you know, 2075. It's weirdly ageless the way it's, um, you know, the, the way it's, it's, uh, it's put together. You have some clues, but you really don't know. I should also say, I'm um, in more generally. I think good horror, and Lynch is fundamentally, in some ways, a horror director. I would say, good horror um, can just be a very intellectually productive genre. You can, you know, you can critique society in very interesting ways with horror. And I'm, I'm very, very fond of Ari Aster, um, the guy who did Hereditary and more recently um, uh, um, Midsommar. In fact, I wrote an essay for, for the American Conservative, um, one of the it's like summer 2020 issue or something like that, basically saying that Ari Aster's movie movies are about the revulsion of a kind of old testament prophet hmm. at the pagan kind of neo-pagan america interesting you know what i have not i i've, I've seen neither and oh, okay uh, but, I, yeah I, yeah I, I, but i, I want to change it right right no, no no i'm 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 very glad to get uh to get educated recommendations well uh my family's here <laughs> <laughs> they, you must go i get it i think this that was a good great. place to stop right this is a great place to stop absolutely have a um, have a great day and thank you very much for, for for doing this thanks dave i appreciate it